Hello and welcome to a special edition of Sociology 101, different than any other that you've probably ever seen. Hopefully you can even hear me because I am at a different studio. Those in the side chat, I see Heaven Guy there. Uh, let me know if you're even hearing me right now because it's just a different setup. I'm in my office at Texas Baptist um, and therefore I don't even know if this is coming through or if it's going to sound okay. Uh, it looks all right. Anything like that. Uh, let me know in the side chat pretty quick. If, if things are not coming through pretty well. Oh, Caleb, there's Caleb. It sounds good. Good, good. Well, I, I wanted to do this because the first time I was able in my, uh, home office to be able, or my, my normal office to do a sociology broadcast. And so I'm often times, um, I, accused of, of not talking about the other things I do enough on this broadcast. Um, you know, other apologists and other people, you know, put everything on their broadcast and they talk about, you know, how many times they ride bicycles and they talk about uh, their families and they talk about all kinds of stuff. Rarely do I do that. And the reason for that is that usually on Sociology 101, I want to focus on that issue of sociology. And that's because I know that's why people come to the broadcast to learn about sociology. The, the problem with that sometimes is that it can give the appearance of imbalance like this is all you ever talk about. This is all I ever hear you talking about is what they should say, because obviously I talk about other things. Uh, I do other things as represented by this office. This office is where I do spend a, a bulk of my time doing other work and other ministry. And, and so I wanted you to at least have a peek in on my life outside of Sociology 101 and into the Texas Baptist life. One of these days, if I get a, uh, a set up there at my house, maybe I'll introduce you to my family. And you can see that other part of my life where I spend a lot more time uh, with my, my family, my children, and my normal life outside of Sociology 101. In fact, if you were to hang out with me um, outside of Sociology 101, you would probably hear me uh, mention Calvinism only when I was on the broadcast. I don't I don't talk about this topic a whole lot. Why? Probably because I talk about it way uh, as much as I ever want to talk about it on the broadcast. And so you don't hear me talking about sociology almost anywhere else except when you're seeing the recordings, to be honest with you. That's just the only, uh, pretty much the only time um, uh, that, that it comes up. Yeah. Somebody mentioning my, my baby Yoda over here. Um, the provisionist perspective is, is, is on the ball already looking at what's behind me. Matter of fact, that says spoken for behind me. That is a theme. That was my last, the, the last year that my dad was the director of youth evangelism was the theme I think was spoken for, if I remember correctly. And that's why I kept that. And, uh, it's just a cool, I thought it was a cool theme. Uh, my dad is younger than me in that picture right there where he is, he's in a studio. He used to do a radio broadcast, uh, back in, uh, in the day. And so he's probably in his mid thirties when that picture was taken. And so I, I hung that in my office as well. Um, those are the pictures up there are pictures of my four children when they were little, as well as more pictures there of my children, which you can see. And there's on the wall behind you are my degrees and uh, other pictures, picture of me and William Lane Craig, one of my prized possessions, uh, uh, me and Lee Strobel and uh, Sean McDowell me and my wife and my family and pictures. You can't see those things. I wish I could have a camera. I should have detached it. And I could just show you around my office, give you a tour here. Um, but what, what I thought I would do is just kind of give, I don't know how to pronounce it. I, I don't want to pronounce his name wrong because then y'all make fun of me and baby Yoda. <laughs> I don't remember what he's called. I watched the series. I watched, I watched that whole thing too. And I don't, I don't remember uh, <laughs> how to pronounce his name. And you know what happens if I mispronounce a name? Y'all never let me live it down, so I'm not even try. <laughs> so uh, that's that's funny. Um, yeah, um, somebody's mentioned, and the fact uh, the fact is that specializing um, Samuel is making the point. Uh, in fact, specializing in a single subject produces greater efficiency in what what he does. In all sciences, this happens as well. Yeah, I mean every every person has um, a specialization. A lot of times, people specialize in a particular field. Uh, and so you could say that I'm a sociologist, as Dr. Brunner <laughs> likes to call me. Uh, and so I do focus on sociology. I did that. That's what I wrote my dissertation on was the rise of Calvinism within our, the Southern Baptist Convention. So that has become something that I have focused on because I was a former Calvinist. I came out of Calvinism. I helped split a church because of Calvinism. So it's a heart issue for me. And that's one of the reasons I focus on it. But I wanted to, in this broadcast, one, test if this would even work here in my office, which apparently it is working. Praise the Lord for that. 
Secondly, I wanted to give an opportunity for you to see my office and what I do outside of Sociology 101 instead of just the same old studio over and over again. And then then also I wanted to introduce you to a little bit about Texas Baptist. Some of you outside of Texas um, don't really care and don't really care to know, but the truth is we are part of the GC2 uh, Great Commission, Great Commandment um, uh, movement of God where any church outside of even Texas can be a part of our convention and a part of our work because Texas Baptist far exceeds the borders of Texas and what we're doing in our ministries. And uh, that's what I wanted to introduce you to the GC2 a brochure here that we're going to be handling, handing out at annual meeting. And if you look through this, this goes through a little bit about what Texas Baptist uh, is, is all about. And, and what you'll read here is on the first page is, um, you know, what makes up the convention. In other words, what, what makes up Texas Baptist? What, who are we? Um, and it says the people in the 5,300 Texas Baptist churches, the 2.3 million members um, are a part of this convention, which meets together at the annual meeting uh, and as, and it helps to support um, more ministries than I have time to go over with you. Uh, this this uh, uh, thing here, this this brochure here, goes through all of the different departments or groups or ministry teams that have to do with um, Texas Baptist and what we do here. So you got the Center for Collegiate Ministries, that's the BSM Baptist Student Ministries. Thousands upon thousands of of people who work with BSMs to help educate our uh, our students. In fact, what's interesting is that Texas Baptists help to subsidize more collegiate uh, students, more students uh, in Baptist schools than all the other state conventions combined. Let me say that again. Texas Baptist helps more Baptist students get an education, help to subsidize their education more than all the other state conventions combined. Uh, in fact, we also, as Texas Baptists, plant more churches than all the other state conventions combined. Okay, let that sink in. Not just more than all the other state conventions, more than all the other state conventions combined. Texas is big. Okay, <laughs> so, so, trying to put a, a just put that into perspective. Um, as of at least two years ago, we had the most baptisms more than any other state convention, not more than any of them combined, obviously, but more than any other state convention, we had more baptisms. It's just a huge convention because Texas is just, is just huge and we're Bible belt. So it's just, it's a huge, huge convention. And I am just a little bitty small <laughs> peg in the, in the, uh, the huge uh, mammoth uh, convention that everything goes on. And so in, in this, you'll see all the different departments and the groups as if you're interested in this. I mean, I, I know this is sociology one-on-one. We should be talking about sociology, but you know, people ask. And so, hey, that's why I'm doing this. Uh, there's the Center for Collegiate Ministries, the Center for a Missional Engagement. This is the missions. They have missions not only in Texas, but their, their mission impact around the world through Texas. Um, and one of those that directly relate to me personally is a See at the Pole. Many of you have heard of See at the Pole, the prayer around the flagpole um, that usually comes around September. My dad helped to start See you at the Pole back in the late 80s, early 90s. And um, that was a Texas Baptist ministry that started here in Texas and has spread globally. Um, the missions engagement have tons of missions opportunity all around the globe. Uh, the Center for Cultural Engagement, the Center for Mission uh, Ministerial Health, the Center for Church Health, all of those I could spend hours on each one of them talking about all the different departments, all the different teams, all the different ministries they're involved in. The one that I happen to be involved in is that one right on the top there, the, the Center for Church Health. Okay. And we have our own little sub booklet. So uh, within that big booklet of all the things they're involved in, then there's the little sub booklet of just the, the, the Center for Church Health, the team that I'm involved in. And on that team, the Center for Church Health, there is discipleship, there is music and worship, there's the GC2 Press with all of the materials, Sunday school materials that we put out, the church, church architecture, uh, helping to build churches and the church health strategy team uh, led by Jonathan there. And so you've got all of these, these groups as well, each of which have, you know, anywhere from five to 10 to 15 different team members on each one of those teams, including my, the team that I, I head up, Evangelism Team, okay? So within, uh, Phil Miller, by the way, is our director for the Center for Church Health, and he is one of the best guys I know. He's a great, great guy. And I'm not just saying that in case he watches this. I would say that even if he, he never heard it, because he is just a cool, really great guy to work with. Um, evangelism ministries, here's us now. Okay. So the big, 
big old group here. And then the, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This is the group that I head up. Okay. So you can see my little uh, fun mug down there in the, in the corner. Um, and so this is the team that I oversee. So we have general evangelism strategies that we train people with. We have apologetics ministry. Eric Hernandez is the lead apologist. You know, he helps to lead our unapologetic conferences and I help to be involved with that as well. But he is the lead of the, the, the apologetics area. And then there's Hispanic evangelism, Victor Rodriguez out of San Antonio. He is the, the head of that, uh, the, that particular, particular team and does an awesome job too. A recharge is head, head by uh, Carlos Francis, who is a former NFL uh, uh, um, receiver for the Raiders. And I don't hold the fact that he used to play for the Raiders against him. Uh, he, you know, um, we root for, for the Cowboys around here, but uh, he's, he's, a, he's very athletic, as you can imagine, but he's also a great communicator. And he heads the African-American ministries and uh, the ministry called Recharge. Super Summer is what I used to be a director of. My dad was a director of that before I was. And um, it doesn't necessarily pass down from generation to generation. It just happened to work out that way for us um, because when he retired, I was largely involved in youth evangelism at the time. And they asked me to fill in for him because he is having some health issues. And then eventually they asked me to, uh, to, to fill that role. And so I was a, a director of Super Summer and youth evangelism for about 13 years before I moved into the director role. And uh, Jason Richards now heads that up. And then Congresso was a part of the Hispanic ministries, the youth ministries that David Gonzalez heads up. Uh, pray for David, by the way. Um, he's going through some, some struggle right now with the loss of a loved one. And I won't get the details, but just pray for uh, David, uh, David's family. It's, I just heard some, uh, some news about his family. And I, I don't know what all I can say and can't say, so I won't be in more details just to say, warrior, prayer warriors pray. Just say a word for David right now. Just say a word of prayer for David and his wife. Um, they're, they're really... Um, going through a loss right now. And so I lift them up, but, um, but that, that's the team and that's the, 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 the ministry that we're involved in. And so I will travel to different associations and churches and groups and speak on evangelism, training and evangelism. Uh, and so if you're a Texas Baptist church or represented with a Texas Baptist church or a church in Texas, even, or a church outside of Texas, even for that matter, I do that sometimes as well. And you have a need for somebody to come speak and train, uh, not only the topic of sociology, but the topic of evangelism and apologetics, those kinds of things, then that's what you would call us for, be a part of our team. And you could go to the About Us page and you can click on, there's a, a form, a Google form that you can do a request for uh, coming to speak. Uh, you can find it at sociology101.com and look under the About Us page and you can find that, that picture and that link. That's usually the best place to go. There's also there at texasbaptist.org, a place for you to go and do that. So you can find out more information about how you could book myself or one of us to come and do training for evangelism and evangelism training and those kinds of things. So I wanted you to hear that that's, what, that that's where I spend the bulk of my time in my life doing church ministry. Uh, and, and, and being a part of uh, evangelism um, and, and what that means. Um, and evangelism has been one of those things in my life that has, has had such an impact when you are able to lead somebody to the Lord. There's no greater feeling in the world than telling somebody about the love of Christ and seeing their life change. Um, a story I've recently told um, was about a young man named Josh in one of the first churches that I was involved in. And, and part of the testimony is really about, it's, it's, it's based out of a sermon that I, I preach on uh, Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2, that's talking about latria. It's one of the few Greek words that I can remember, and I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it exactly right, but latria or latria, however you want to pronounce it. Um, it's the word that's often translated into the word worship, but it's also known for the word service. And those are two very different connotations in English. When I think of worship, most of us, when we think, hey, are you going to worship? What do we, what do we think of? Are you going to sing songs? Are you going to sing praise songs? That's what you're usually thinking of when you think of worship. But the, the original Greek or the person uh, in the original uh, churches wouldn't probably have thought of worship in that way. They would have thought more of the concept or idea of service. Um, and so... The, this concept and idea that that worship, the praise that we sing, flows from a heart of worship, from serving God, um, and so that that's so important. And I talk about this young man named Josh, 
who really taught me this lesson about how true praise flows out of a heart of, of service and, um, and how that, that really uh, transpired was that this, this young man was one of those kind of kids that he would show up the fifth quarters and just make fun of everything. And, and he was just too cool to be, you know, to be there kind of a guy, you know, this is done. This is for sissies. This is for little kids, that kind of thing at the, at the, at the, um, any kind of youth gathering, he would come and just kind of mock everything that was going on because he was just too cool to be there. And one particular, uh, fifth quarter, he was there and he made some really rude comment about the food that was being served right in front of some of the ladies who had worked all day to help make that happen. And I could see just this devastating look upon this woman's face, this elderly woman, this saint (laughs) that had worked so hard to prepare these meals for these kids. And this kid, this bully, a just jerk of a kid, um, just says something that just crushes her spirit. And I was so angry. I had just this kind of this righteous indignation coming over me. And I wanted just to grab Josh by the nap of the neck and throw him out. And um, really a, a big part of me wanted just to just to wring his neck because he was just being mean. He was being a jerk. Um, but the but only by God's grace, I didn't. Um, I was headed to do just that. And I just felt the, the spirit kind of come upon me as, as, you know, I'm a Baptist. He doesn't speak audibly to me. I couldn't handle that. But um, he just like, he, he got in my face and, and, and he reminded me of something my grandfather had taught. My grandfather had just died a couple of weeks before this event happened. And so he was fresh on my mind and I'd been talking about my grandfather a lot and I spoke at his funeral. And so he was really on my mind and I remember something my grandfather taught me. And it's something that's common in churches. You've probably heard it before that, um, uh, hurting people are, are hurting people. In other words, hurt, Hurt people hurt other people. And um, we all know this. Misery loves company. Uh, people who are hurting tend to hurt other people. That's just the tendency. Um, and that's what bullies are. Bullies are people who who put down other people and hurt other people because they themselves are hurting. Uh, and I was reminded of that. And I, I remember thinking to my myself that this kid is probably hurting and that's why he's hurting other people. Um, and therefore, God just gave me a compassion for Josh that I wouldn't have had otherwise fleshly Leighton, normal Leighton just wanted to throw him out on his butt. Get out of here. You know, get, you you don't like this stuff. Get out of here. I was mad at him. Every, every part of Leighton wanted to get rid of him. It was only by the grace of God that I saw him with the compassionate eyes of Christ and saw him as somebody who Jesus died for, saw him as somebody who, who needed compassion. And so by the grace of God, I can I confronted him, but in such a way as to restore the relationship and invited him to come back and found out some of the things that he was interested in doing in lawn care and some other things that he had done to try to raise money and all of these kinds of things. And so I said, hey, why don't you come up and help us with a lawn here at the church then? And you can make some extra money and just whatever I could to find a kind of point of connection. I found out he collect baseball cards and I would go out of my way to to go buy some certain kinds of baseball cards and drop it by his house and invited him to different events. And I was trying to get him to come to the disciple. Now a disciple now is a youth event that we would have at our churches. And it was a really cool thing because this is a little small country church, like a one light, you know, one, a type school, the, the football games were real big there, but I mean, it was just a small little country town, but we would combine with the other churches in that area and the bigger churches to have this kind of the final big event at the end of the disciple now weekend, where we would have this, the, the convention center kind of rented out and all these churches would come together with like a thousand kids or more um, at, at this big convention. And we'd have big name speakers. I think it was somebody like, you know, Louis Giglio, I think, or somebody like that. And uh, Chris Tomlin or somebody like that. I can't remember the exact people at this particular event, but they were, they were big name uh, people that were at this event. And, um, and, and I remember wanting Josh to, to come to this event because I wanted him to experience, you know, church and, and to, to, and I'd been kind of working on him and kind of sharing things about the gospel with him here and there. He was always too cool for it. I don't want to talk about that stuff. And just, um, it was always kind of making excuses for why he didn't want to come to the church and all these kinds of things. And, um, and every time I would bring up the gospel or bring up Christ, he, Oh, I don't want you preaching at me, that kind of stuff. And he would, and I did, I didn't want to, um, run him off. And so I just would kind of, uh, invite him to come back for different events and make up excuses for him to be there or make up excuses for me to stop by. And um, 
I, I kept inviting over and over and over again to this disciple now, hoping this would be finally the weekend he would come and get involved. And, uh, and, and to my disappointment, he didn't show up to the Thursday night event that we had. And then the, the Friday stuff, he just didn't come. And, uh, and I was real disappointed and it came to the end of the disciple now weekend to where we had the big, large event there in the Gainesville area. And, and so all the churches had got together for this big event and the, the music was playing and I really didn't feel that connected to the music. And I really wasn't worshiping probably the way I should. I was probably distracted or something. And, um, and the, 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 the guy gets up and he preaches and a lot of, a lot of students came forward and they would, a lot of, a lot of decisions were made and, you know, it was a really great event. Um, but I was really kind of disappointed because Josh didn't show up and, uh, for, you know, for the whole disciple now weekend. And so, um, we're, we're about to leave and the, the kids are heading to the church bus and I'd driven separately kind of following the, the youth pastor and, and, um, the, the group that was there. And, and I, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed there's Josh. He actually had shown up to the big event, but he just didn't come with our church. And, and it, and it really surprised me. And I look at him and I noticed his eyes are kind of red and he's kind of wiping his face and he's obviously been crying. So I, I tell the group to go on without me. And, and I make a beeline over to Josh and I say, Hey, Josh, man, how you doing? What's going on? And he, you know, he immediately kind of puts on that posture again, like everything's fine. You know, I'm cool. I'm fine. No, oh, Hey, brother Layton, everything's cool. Fine. Uh, what's going on? I say, Oh, nothing. I'm just, you know, I heard it was going to be good music and you kept telling me I should come. So I thought, you know, I can't come for the whole weekend, but I thought I'd come to this. Uh, it's cool, man. You know? And so, so yeah, but Josh, what, what's going on with you? Oh, nothing. I'm cool. You know, he just kind of kept playing it off. He just had this facade on this mask on, you know, he couldn't show any, any, any kind of vulnerability. And I just kept pressing him. I said, Josh, it's me, man. You can tell me what's going on. Nothing, nothing, Josh, what's going on. And finally, after like three or four times, just asking Josh, tell me what's going on. He it's like a floodgate just opens up and he just begins just to pour out all that's going on in his life. Just, all the hardship and his, his father leaving when he was very young, his mother's dealing with alcoholism and other issues. And the fact that he was doing lawn stuff, not just for extra money, he was actually trying to make money for his family, not to lose their house for goodness sake. And, and I realized how much this kid was hurting that I didn't have any clue about. And I, he finally just became vulnerable. And, and he said, and I heard this message tonight and I know I need something. I know something has to change and I just don't know what it is. What do I have to do to be saved? And, and I, I told him, I said, Jesus has done what needs to be done for you to be saved. Your responsibility is to trust in him. Will you trust in him? Will you give your life to following him? And we talked for a while and I explained to him more about the gospel and answered some questions. And, uh, and that night he prayed to receive Christ and, um, it, I've never seen anybody's uh, accountants change as much as I saw, saw Josh's accountants change. He's just, his whole demeanor just transformed from that too cool for school kind of attitude of the bully to just this humble, um, just gracious, kind kid. It's like immediate kind of a change. So much so that right after we, we left our conversation, he goes over to the snack table where all his friends are hanging out and he immediately just announces, you know, hey guys, I just prayed to receive Jesus. And it, it was just, it was a crazy change. And you can imagine how much influence a, a kid like that can have. He was a good looking kid and athletic and everybody looked up to him. And whenever his demeanor like that changes, he had a huge impact on reaching the students there at that school uh, and, and, the influence he was able to have is much more so than a pastor or a youth pastor could have in the school. And so it was really a, a qu quite a awesome experience to, to, to see him come to know Christ in that way. And, and I remember that when I get back in my car, um, I, I turn on the, the radio and one of the Chris Tomlin songs comes on and it's the exact same song we had just sung a few minutes earlier in that congregation that I really wasn't connecting with, but all of a sudden I'm just singing at the top of my lungs with tears running down my face uh, as I'm worshiping God. And it was in that moment that I, I recognized why the word Latreia, the, that, that concept of worship and service are one and the same in the original languages. 
is because it's through serving God and being used as a vessel to communicate the word of God and to see a life change that way, that the natural flow of praise came and, and the emotion came and the connection with God came. Um, why? Because it's it, praising God through song is an outflow of service. It's an outflow that over kind of bubbles up over when you see God at work in, the, in somebody's life, when you see somebody's life changed. And when you're one of the instruments that's used to help see a life change so dramatically like that, the natural praise flows from that. Um, and, and that's why within the scriptures, that connection between worshiping God, praising God, loving God through loving others are in separable. They're one and the same. You can't have one without the other. In fact, usually if you're bored at church and you're bored in the song service, or you're just concerned about which style of song service there, oh, I wish they would do hymns. Oh, I wish they would do praise courses. If you're, if that, if that's what's motivating you to praise God, then more than likely you're just going to get bored with, with church altogether, because what really engages our heart in true worship and praise, as well as in engaging with the word being preached, is when when we're living that out, you know, Monday through Saturday, not just when we're sitting in a pew on a Sunday morning, and, and that that becomes a real thing when you begin to experience personal evangelism, when you're spending time not just debating theological concepts, um, not just talking about the omni everything's of God and all of the different attributes and how they philosophically play themselves out. When that becomes a real heart-wrenching change of who you are is when you see God change the life of somebody in front of you, when you, when you lead somebody to that, uh, that relationship. And, um, and so uh, there's, there's part of me that, that wants to do better uh, even on, on the sociology 101 page and, and broadcast to not only to, to emphasize the importance, I think, of the doctrine of sociology, sociology with regard to God's love and his desire for all to be saved, because I do believe that is sociology 101. In, in other words, in order to graduate from sociology 101, I think you have to understand the basics of God's character and his desire and provision for all people. There, there is a need for that um, that in our, our lives to, to, to know that and to understand it and understand why we believe our Calvinistic brothers are wrong in their interpretation of scriptures. That's important for us to discuss, but it's also important, I think for me as the host of the show to at least at times pull back a glimpse of other aspects of, of how uh, soteriology and the doctrines of God's salvation can impact and influence how we do evangelism and the importance of evangelism. And so I, I will try uh, as I have opportunity to share more testimonies of things that are happening in, in my world as an evangelist and as uh, one who trains and does evangelism events and apologetics events and those kinds of things. Um, and, and, and try to engage with more other, other topics with regard to uh, how sociology, you know, and the practical world uh, affects our lives and what we're doing. Um, and, and I know this, that there's some side chat uh, th things that are happening over here as far as questions and other comments about, um, ab about a Texas Baptist. Somebody asked earlier, um, I think it's Sojourner, I think it was. Um, let's see. I, I was going to sc scroll back up here. Oh, yeah, there it is. Sojourner. Um, you ask, are there any churches outside of Texas that are affiliated with Texas Baptists? Yes, there are. Um, we, the Texas Baptists are a part of, of what's called GC2, which is the Great Commandment, Great Commission, the, to love Christ. That's one of y'all, the reason y'all hear me say, uh, go now and, sh sh uh, what, you know, share Christ and show love. Um, that's part of what the Texas Baptist logo is talking about, the, the, the twofold purpose of share Christ and show love, great commandment, great commission. That's GC2. And so we have churches in Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma and uttermost parts of the world that are affiliated as a part of the Texas Baptist Convention um, that that are, don't have to put Baptist on their name or say they're Texas Baptist because they're not in Texas. It wouldn't make sense. But they say they're a part of GC2. 
And so if you're interested in that, you can contact us at Texas Baptist and we can, can connect you with how you can be a part of the network of Texas Baptist or GC2 churches um, that, are, that are supporting what we're doing as Texas Baptist. So if, if that's of interest to you, then by all means, yeah, contact us, reach out to us. It won't be me in specific that would probably help you with that. But um, we could put you in contact with a person that oversees the affiliations uh, and how you could become affiliated with GC2 as a part of what the overall Texas Baptist ministry is a part of. So yes, the answer to that question is yes, you can be a part of that, even if you don't uh, live in Texas. Um, Nathan, <laughs> he, he breaks things down uh, pretty, pretty well. Uh, I, I like to see Nathan's comments. He's always making good comments. Um, he says, let me break this down simply. Leighton's channel is primary, primarily to combat Calvinism. I don't think it's wrong to point that out, but to claim that's all he does is false. Absolutely. That's a, it's a good uh, way of looking at it. Um, I, I am combating the claims of Calvinistic theology while at the same time promoting provisionistic soteriology. So I'm not just saying get rid of Calvinism and don't replace it with anything. I'm saying there's something better than Calvinism and it's I've called it provisionism. Some call it traditional Southern Baptist perspective. Uh, I like to call it provisionism. Why? Because God provides. And that's a really good thing to focus on is the provision of God. Um, let's see. I'm just saying, uh, why do you think there's been a rise uh, of, of Calvinism recently? Um, I, I go over that in some of my other programs. Um, where do all these Calvinists come from? If you search that on Sociology 101, I, uh, I actually play a, a clip from a, another Calvinist who is asking that question? Why? Why are they coming? Uh, why is Calvinism resurging right now? And and I go over that. So if you want to search for that, you can find it. Um, let's see. Thank you, Jose, for your kind words. Do you think uh, Calvinism has some tendencies of Gnosticism? We again, we talk about that too in my uh, interviews with Ken Wilson. Um, the, the, some of the unique claims of Calvinistic soteriology with regard to uh, the inability of man to respond positively to the gospel is not found in the first 400 years of Christian teaching. The only place it's found is in Gnostic writings. And so there is a, a, a definite um, scholarship that says, from leading scholars that say that the earliest church uh, for the first 400 years didn't teach total moral inability from birth. And then uh, the concept of unconditional election, irresistible grace, which are the core tenets of the Calvinistic worldview. Those are first seen in Augustine uh, in his later writings when he's, uh, when he's uh, confronting what he calls Pelagianism or the, the teachings of Pelagius, which have been uh, misaligned based upon what scholarship showing now from his actual writings. But nevertheless, um, hopefully that's, that's helpful to you. Uh, look for my interviews with Ken Wilson on uh, on the broadcast, and you'll find more information about that. All right, let's see. I'm just scrolling through here to see if there's other question. Um, Yeah, th um, yeah. Hope hopefully this is helpful. Um, he's just saying thanks for showing the side of the ministry, I and I've been meaning to do this for a while. Um, I I've been wanting to also have my wife on uh, as an, uh, you know, she is a, a therapist, a marriage family therapist, and we've had several discussions about how a person's view of God affects even your marriage and affects your relationship to God and affects just overall worldview is issues because she was a Calvinist too. She's a Bible major and uh, was used to she used to, she used to tutor all of us preacher boys in Greek because she knows she actually knows grammar real well English grammar which is one of the reasons she corrects my grammar quite regularly that way that's why whenever you people correct my pronunciation of words and my mispronunciations and my um, all my little grammar mistakes and stuff like that I I, I see it as a, a love language actually because I'm used to it from my wife so. Uh, and it doesn't bother me that much. Um, and she used to she used to t tutor uh, Greek students, and so she knows she knows Greek really really well and grammar really well really well. And as a Bible major, so she's not uh, ignorant of these things. And she was a Calvinist along with me for a good uh, you know ten years at the time, and we both kind of came out of it out of it together. So uh, I'd I'd like to have her on at some time. She's a little bit nervous about doing stuff. Uh, on a broadcast, but she, I, I think I could talk her into it if we could record it and not do it live because a lot of these broadcasts like this one's live. And so I don't think she wants to do a live broadcast, but maybe I can do something on a recording if I can twist her arm to get her to do it. Um, 
yeah, you're well, you're welcome, Leah. Thank you for those kind of words. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Arthur saying, get out of the SBC. You know, you know, I've heard a lot of people kind of that with that sentiment of the SBC is going downhill because it's slowly becoming Calvinist kind of thing. <laughs> well, it's already, it's already there. Um, a lot of the leaders with Al Mohler being so influential within the seminaries, uh, the, most of the seminaries now are led by at least presidents who lean Calvinistically, if not all the way, at least three to four point Calvinists, if whatever that means, uh, depending on your perspective. Um, a lot of them are churning out more Calvinistic uh, pastors. And so uh, a lot of churches are getting fed up with that. That's one of the reasons you'll see more and more, I think, starting to come over and associating with a GC2 crowd, uh, Texas Baptist, because they're, they're, they're tired of sending monies to a, an organization that seems to be promoting predominantly Calvinistic resources. Um, and there's others that are upset about the whole... Um, uh, just the, the political issues that are going on within the Southern Baptist Convention now and some of the issues with, uh, uh, you know, oversight and uh, of lawyer oversight and all that kind of stuff is going on right now. Um, conventions are always going to have these kinds of ebbs and flows and issues because we're fallen human beings uh, and we make mistakes and, and conventions and institutions all have issues. But I am firmly convinced that together we can do more. There, there is a lot of value in organizing and working together as individual churches combine with their local associations and their state conventions. There is so much that as being a state worker, I've seen behind the scenes that I know would not be accomplished by individual churches and, and how individual churches can pull some of the things that, uh, that the conventions pull off. It just would not be possible. But the conventions must be held to account. And there must be oversight and there must be um, transparency with how things are used and how monies are used and how people uh, do what they do. That has to happen. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not going to speak ill of the Southern Baptist Convention as a whole because the Southern Baptist Convention as a whole has a, a lot of wonderful people with a lot of wonderful ministries being supported. And we don't you don't want to pull the plug on something that is supporting so many ministries you're not even aware of. Um, that's what some people don't recognize. When you stop supporting Texas Baptist, for example, then all of a sudden the BSM ministry, which was re reaching hundreds of students on your student's local college campus, and all of a sudden their ministry is just gone. And you go, well, I wonder why that happened. Well, it's because in your last business meeting, you voted to stop supporting Texas Baptist ministries. Why did all these scholarships go away for Baptist students that are going to Baptist universities and Baptist seminaries? Well, because you stopped supporting through your local ministries. Um, and a lot of people don't recognize the the one-to-one -one ratio impact that it has when you stop giving to uh, the, the uh, associations and the state conventions. Now, what, what can happen, however, is when the convention itself, the leadership of the convention itself, becomes so disassociated with the local bodies that you have misrepresentations. And I think, at least in the theological world, there's a lot of that going on with regard to sociology because the average layman in the pew probably has no idea that the money that they're going to support is supporting the production of and the training of predominantly Calvinistic theologians. And, and therefore, um, I think a lot of average churchgoers within the Southern Baptist Convention would have a, a problem with the fact that the seminaries within the Southern Baptist Convention are almost exclusively hiring uh, uh, Calvinistic theologians to train the future pastors. Um, that's not the case with every single seminary, but it is uh, it is becoming more and more so with every passing year because the way that the system is set up, there is committees that appoint the different uh, uh, presidents and the presidents are the ones who ultimately have hiring and firing power with regard to the deans of their uh, individual theological schools. Um, and so you've got men like Al Mohler who are unapologetically a five hardcore five point Calvinist for that matter. He's a, he's a staunch five point Calvinist shares the stage with, Piper and Sproul and others uh, together for the gospel as part of that whole group. He is a five-point capitalist, and he has largely influenced the naming of the, the presidents of the, uh, of the seminaries. And those presidents have a large influence, obviously, over what deans, um, who the deans are and who the deans are going to hire. And let's just face it, 
Calvinists typically have a really high view of other Calvinists and a real low view of people who are not Calvinists when it comes to theological training. And more than likely, they're not going to hire a non-Calvinist. Now, the opposite is not typically true. A lot of people who are non-Calvinist aren't really educated on the issue of Calvinism and soteriology, and they will have a high view of a theologian who may be a Calvinist without even recognizing the distinctions that they ultimately hold to. So oftentimes you'll see non-Calvinists hiring Calvinists to teach a theology class, but you very rarely will ever see the, the reverse, where you have a Calvinist hiring a non-Calvinist to teach a theology class. Um, it, it just, it just very rare that you'll see that. So the more Calvinistic presidents and deans of theology that we have in all the seminaries across the country that are training our future pastors are, are training them to believe the Bible Cal from the Calvinistic worldview. Um, and that will just continue to happen until there's an uprising of some sort uh, within the, the Texas Baptist church or within churches in general, Southern Baptist churches across the state to say, okay, well, if we're not going to have representation in our seminaries, then we're going to stop giving money to our seminaries until they start representing the kind of theological worldview that that represents us, at least fairly, at least to where you're hiring um, people who teach the other side and not just indoctrinating them into Calvinistic theology. You've got to have representation on both sides. I was just recently, just today, at a university teaching on soteriology because the professors that brought me in said, your view is not being represented in the, the seminaries uh, fairly. Um, they're, they're almost exclusively getting Calvinistic education in the Southern Baptist seminaries, almost exclusively. And even the, in my experience, even the professors who hold to a view more closely aligned to me are typically pretty quiet about their view because they don't want to lose their jobs. And so they'll just make it a non-issue. And then the Calvinists will usually leave them alone. Um, and won't bother them because if they speak out very boldly about their perspective, then they're going to get the ax <laughs> pretty quick. In fact, I'm not going to say any names of any places, so I don't want to get anybody in trouble. I taught at a university for a while when I first started this broadcast, the Sociology 101 broadcast, and I was contacted by the higher ups because they were contacted by some of the, I guess, board members or I guess the funders of that university saying he shouldn't be associating himself with the name of this university because we don't want to be associated with something that's standing out against Calvinism. In other words, John Piper and John MacArthur and all the other guys can associate themselves with schools without any problem. But if Leighton Flowers associates himself with a school, we're going to pull the funding unless you stop that. So I was asked to stop associating with that university while I was doing the broadcast or having anything to do with the broadcast. Now, that happened probably four or five years ago. That's happened a while back. And since then, that same university has come back and apologized for doing that and wish they hadn't. <laughs> and, uh, and I can understand why they wish they hadn't. I think Trinity Seminary, that I do promote quite regularly now, gets probably about five or 10 new uh, students every month because of Sociology 101. And they're probably kicking themselves in the foot going, uh, kicking themselves going, ah, man, we should have probably just let him associate with us uh, because they would have probably got a lot more publicity that way. But nevertheless, there, there, that, that's power. Power is where the money is. And, and the leadership of the SBC, predominantly the main, the, the movers and the shakers, the guys who are calling the shots are more Calvinistic. And if you control the money, you control a lot. And, um, and right now the Southern Baptist convention is, is very much controlled by uh, predominantly more Calvinistic leaning, or if, if there are some non-Calvinist in the mix, they're real quiet about it. <laughs> they just go along to get along kind of a mindset. And so um, until churches, until individual pastors um, start to, to do something about it and start to say, you know what, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to make our statement. We're going to make a, a clear uh, indication to the SBC that we want fair representation of, but we don't want to indoctrinate people. It's fine to teach people. Trinity, where I teach, teaches Calvinism, but it also teaches provisionism. It teaches both sides. We require to read books by James White and Leighton Flowers. We don't just teach Calvinism. And places like Southern, where Alan Muller is, you go there, and I've had students on. This is that they only teach Calvinism. They will not teach the other side. 
They don't, they don't represent the other side, at least uh, from what I'm being told. And I think that needs to stop. Personally, I think we should have fair representation in all of our seminaries as far as the different sociological views. Uh, will will the, the SBC split over that issue? Probably not over that issue, at least right now. It's a side issue. Uh, it used to be a bigger issue back in the mid 2000 teens, you know, 2015, you know, 14, 15, that, that area of time. It was a lot more of, a, of an issue that was on the forefront. Right now, with all this political stuff going on, that's on the forefront. Um, uh, and there's, uh, you know, other, other issues that could cause church splits or, or a split of the convention. I don't know if that'll come about or not. Um, I'm not, I'm not hoping for it or praying for it by any means. Um, but at the same time, I, I do think that the SBC uh, is going through some struggles right now, especially with all that's going on in the political arena and the lack of transparency. I think there's going to be some, some issues that come from that. And I'm not sure what that all is going to entail. If, if they hire, if they would have elected someone like Al Mohler as the president, which I think he was second or third in the running, he didn't win. It was like a three or four way split. And I think if it had been just one against the other, he might have won. I don't know. But if if he would have won, someone like Al Mohler would have won the presidency. I think it would have been more of a, a beacon call to the non-Calvinists to be like, we've got to do something because it's just uh one right after another of, of, uh, you know, presidents who are going to name other Calvinists to, to succeed them in the committees, the leaders of the committees. And then there's no turning back with regard to where the convention ends up and where it goes. And so people who are, uh, uh, concerned about that, uh, need to start doing something about it. Nothing's going to change, uh, what is, what is it they say? Um, evil prevails when good men do nothing. Well, bad theology prevails when good theologians do nothing. When people who have right doctrine do nothing and just sit on the sidelines and don't say anything, um, then you know you're, you can't expect change unless you're willing to be an agent of change, unless you're willing to say something and do something about it. So I encourage uh, those of you who are involved with the Southern Baptist Convention to uh Write letters if it requires to write letters. Uh, allocate the funds that you send to places where you think it's going to serve uh, the best purposes for the people that you want it to serve. Um, you know, partner with places like Texas Baptist and GC2 if uh, you'd like to support what we're doing and be a part of a, a, a bigger uh, organization that can help pe- more people do more for the kingdom. Um, so uh, I, I think it's it's really important for us to understand those things, but. All right. Well, I want to bring this to a close because I didn't want to go too far um, uh, this today. I just wanted to make sure that this uh, this was working, and it apparently is because I'm seeing your side chat stuff, and I've got it all set up here. So um, now, if I want to jump on here at the uh, the office to uh, to reply to something or to work on something with uh, with all my theology geeks, I can do that here from the Texas Baptist office on Rambler. All right. Well, as always, I'll remind you now, go share Christ and show love.